tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The Hungry Fangs of Tolliver's Grove Narrated by Felipe Ojeda Death slept in the house at the end of Tolliver's Grove. It hadn't always slept there, but found the house to be conductive to its needs. Once Tolliver's Grove was a bustling bedroom community, but it relied on a nearby factory for prosperity. When the factory shut down, all the managers and accountants who had bought the cozy little houses nearby drifted elsewhere, leaving only husks behind. The creature likes such husks. There was a thin, fragile creature with weak limbs and capable of much in the way of physical defense, so shelter was essential as it lay in wait for life to consume. It only needed to feed rarely, and this house was perfect. Ever so often, something with a beating heart and warm red blood would enter. It would take its sustenance and wait. Death slept in the house, but things that sleep can also wake. The creature didn't have a name. It was not aware enough of the world outside itself to understand the need for a name, but out in the world it might be called a vampire for its penchant for drinking blood and leaving hollowed out husks behind. Like vampires of human legend, it vaguely resembled a human in shape and coloring. But that is where they diverged from conventional expectations. Rather than fangs and claws, the creature had an extra organ on its back that resembled a hump, and rather than a human head, its features more closely resembled an anteater with large blood-red eyes. Death slept most of the time, but the creature woke on the evening in question. It smelled blood in the air, and its stomach rumbled. Its long, thin fingers rubbed over its hairless head as it woke, and then down over the top of its hump. Hundreds of holes spread over the top of the hump. It used these to feed. When it was ready, hundreds of tick-like creatures bred inside the hump would emerge, gather the blood the vampire needed, and then it would eat the ticks until it was satiated. The noises of the house told it that prey had entered. Prey, in this instance, was a group of urban explorers who had heard whispered rumors of the house on Tolliver's Grove. People said odd things happened there. Locals said the house was haunted. Some went as far as to say the whole street was cursed, but the explorers had come only for the one house. They bought trappings of modern discovery, including cameras, EMP detectors, headlamps, and sleeping bags to stay the night. The creature knew none of this. It only knew a meal had arrived. Nor did the noises the people made make any sense to it at all. The human speech was no more meaningful than a bird's warbling, except the creature knew that people had more blood, and that these noises meant people. In this case, it was five people, two couples, and one single. A proper feast. The creature listened to the noises to track them around the house. When their voices got too close, they would creep away. It would sequester in a closet or climb up in the vents if needed. Once it shimmied up inside the flue at the back of the fireplace to ascend to the second floor. It certainly looks creepy here, one of them said. Sometimes these local haunted houses are just disappointing, but this place had an aura. I love it. Let's take a brief look around, another said. Then we'll pick a spot and set up for the night. They clambered over the house looking for things of interest, exclaiming over this and that as they moved. They particularly went crazy over an upstairs bedroom with a chimney connected to the downstairs fireplace. Their EMF devices went off there though they might be interested to know that the only supernatural thing present was in exactly the opposite direction at the time. The vampire hunkered in the shadows, mostly in a closet. The meal smelled delightful, and it waited for them to settle down into one spot so it could pick its own place for the night. Its consumption method worked well with its prey close to the vampire since the vampire didn't actually feed upon the prey directly but sent out hordes of little blood-sucking fleas to gather its meal. We should stay in the fireplace room tonight, 
one of the explorers said. Her name, though the vampire neither knew nor cared, was Eve. She was the newest member of the group, and as such, always tried a little too hard. Her boyfriend was part of it and had talked the others into bringing her along. She'd been telling her own friends that he was the one. The pressure of making things work was especially strong for her. Unlike the others, she noticed the odd piles of fur around the edges of the room, leftovers from the vampire's meals. But she was afraid to point it out and have them laugh, so she said nothing. Eve's boyfriend, Joe, throwing an arm around his girlfriend, said, This room's good. He had been sleeping with Eve's best friend for a few months until the other woman broke things off and threatened to tell. Given this, Joe was particularly preoccupied with making sure things seemed innocent and not at all focused on finding supernatural clues. Even I'll stay here. The other couple claimed one of the side bedrooms for the night. Grace and Kelly didn't want to be exploring anymore, but they hadn't told each other that. Both of them kept it a secret for the other's sake. Only the unoccupied guy was left to select a spot to sleep for the night. He glanced nervously around him. Uh, I guess I'll stay downstairs. Someone should. The truth was, he didn't mind the distance from the others. He suspected none of them took this seriously, at least not as seriously as he did. George really believed in ghosts and the supernatural. His parents had died when he was young, only 15, and since then, he had a personal mission for proving things on the other side of the veil existed. What did worry him was the feel of the house. It was too quiet without any of the usual evidence of animal intrusion. If asked, he would have said the house seemed unnaturally quiet. No one asked. There are no bedrooms down there, Grace said practically. Are you certain you want to sleep there? She smelled particularly good to the vampire, and so he tracked her words closely. I don't need a bedroom, George said. It always feels like a horror movie when we camp out places like this, Kelly said. Grace leaned her head on Kelly's shoulder. Let's hope not, since I think only Eve comes anywhere near final girl status. Are you sure you want to sleep alone? Kelly asked. In horror movies... This isn't a horror movie, George snapped, then smiled to soften the harsh tone of his words. The house had him on edge. They went back to exploring, and the vampire hid. Ticks buzzed inside its hump, preparing for the huge meal. It would need a lot of ticks to transport so much blood. Most would end up wasted. The vampire could only ingest so much, but it wasn't interested in food conservation. Each of the nearby creatures would provide it with a snack. Grace would be the main course. The skin of its hump rippled and a few stray ticks emerged from the holes. Nighttime came, as it always did, after the day slowly frittered its time away. The people did not immediately go to sleep, which irritated the vampire vaguely. It was hungry, and the red-blooded things usually fell asleep in a timely fashion. These, however turned on old false lights to light the house well after the sun was down. George and Joe lit a fire in the fireplace, and the vampire didn't like the smell of the gas they used to help ignite the small blaze. Luckily for the vampire, they put the fire out when Eve complained it made too much smoke and wasn't actually heating everything. Finally, they pulled out their sleeping bags and settled down. The vampire found a convenient spot between a derelict toilet and a shower. It was directly between the two couples. When their heartbeat slowed with sleep, it hunkered down, positioning its hump above it like a turtle shell, and emitted the first cloud of ticks. And it felt the heat pouring off of them, allowing it to track them easily. Eve was the first to feel the ticks bite. She stirred in her sleep, smacking at her lip where the first settled. Then the cloud fell in force. She woke, eyes flying wide, and she tried to stand to fight. But millions of fleas clouded over her, and in the end, she didn't fight at all. The deadly mantle settled around her until all she saw was a rippling blackness. 
she slipped into a deeper sleep, an eternal one. Meanwhile, the vampire put off another cloud of ticks, and another, and another. It kept pumping them out as fast as it could. It had lived in the house a long time, and in that time its ticks had chewed tiny holes through the walls, ceilings, and floors. They traveled without impediment through the house and the rooms, swarming under doors and seemingly blooming out of the woodwork. Joe woke up more quickly, perhaps alerted by Eve's brief struggles. He managed to get to his feet and stumble a few feet, swatting at the air at a seemingly endless cloud of death. He caught a few ticks that had already fed, splattering droplets of his own blood along with ticks over his body. His head grew light, and he fell. He crawled a few more feet, dragging himself towards some impossible salvation. By this time, the vampire was feeding, slipping in snoutfuls of ticks and drawing the blood from their tiny bodies. Grace and Kelly felt the bites of the ticks at the same time. Kelly might have made it to the window and attempted to jump to safety, if not for Kelly stopping for Grace. Kelly wouldn't leave without Grace, and she passed away without ever waking. It might have comforted Kelly to know that as death stole over them both, leaping from the window wouldn't have stopped the ticks. They would have been just as happy drinking from her on the grass as inside the house. Death came swiftly, drained one drop at a time, but by hundreds of thousands if not millions of ticks. The vampire gorged itself on Kelly and Grace. Already there was too much blood to consume. Many of the ticks were dying around the room in piles against the walls. It didn't see any point in creating more ticks for the creature downstairs. It ate until it could eat no more, and then hunkered down, closed its great red eyes, and fell into a dreamless sleep. Unfortunately for the vampire, humans weren't like their usual mindless prey. Had it been a family of raccoons that fed the vampire that night, it would have slept deeply and long and woken refreshed. This was not what happened. Instead, it woke smelling smoke. It twitched and opened a red eye to thick air. Piles of ticks still lay around the room. It might have snapped on some of them later if not for the heat and smoke quickly filling the upstairs bathroom. The vampire scuttled out of the room and into the hall, only to find the same problem there. In fact, it saw flames coming from some of the rooms and from the stairs. It let out a high squealing noise, the only sound it ever made, and turned to climb into the vents, but they were hot, burning its skin. Fear of death is ingrained, and it turned out that even this creature of death could feel the racing pulse of terror at the idea of its own life snuffed out. There weren't many options of where to go. It could have braved the window and jumped down, but it didn't see any clear path out that way. It hurried down a few stairs but found its way to the front door blocked by flame. There was one last avenue. It ran over to the chimney on the second floor bedroom. It had on occasion shimmied up and down the flue to get someplace. This time up seemed more tempting, but it feared it would be trapped there if it reached the roof. Its limbs were too thin and fragile to survive a fall. So instead, the creature used its long hairless arms and legs to propel itself through the tight chimney flue to the ground floor. Then it crawled from the chimney, skin coated in old ash and eyes stinging from fresh smoke. There was a clear path to the back door. It ran out, smoke billowing after it. Behind the house was an expanse of woods. New woods, since back when the factory off Tolliver's Grove had been functioning, it was a park. The vampire scurried towards the trees but glanced back toward the line of the houses along the street. Perhaps it briefly considered simply switching houses, but something instinctual told it it was not wise. The vampire's last glance of the street saw George in front of the house, watching it burn. The flames cast a bright, hungry glow, and a thick plume of black smoke curled up into the sky. George's face was covered in tears, and he held a red gas can. The vampire wasn't hungry, so George didn't interest it overly much, but it did wonder briefly 
what the red-blooded man was doing. It couldn't have known, and it wouldn't have cared, that George had woken early to find his friends dead and the unexplicable hordes of ticks covering the entire house. George had finally found his proof of the supernatural, and he wished he hadn't. If he'd stopped to think of it, maybe he would have been glad that he wasn't in a horror movie and survival wasn't predicated on final girl tropes. The vampire headed off into the woods. If it carried anything with it from its experience, the vampire held the slight sorrow for losing its stored snacks and its feeding grounds. But both things had happened to the vampire before, and would again. Death lives a very long time. In May, Marcus thought of it as the hottest summer he could remember. By August, he thought of it as the summer of flies. But it wasn't just the flies that were bad that summer. All of the other insects seemed to be out in abundance as well. Every day, waking up in this fly-infested apartment, he would find another mosquito bite looking more like a welt. The flies were the gross kind, slow and green. The kind Marcus always imagined liking shit. Another disgusting thing Marcus realized about the flies. Where there were flies, there were maggots. He imagined them under the damp kitchen tile in his apartment, squirming together in trash cans throughout the town, praying with militant glee in the graveyard. The maggots were there. The flies were there. But the flies, as they swarmed and irritated everyone, were not the only things making the summer memorable. There were also the disappearances. The early afternoon temperature was in the mid-90s. It would hover around 98 before the sun went down in the evening. Marcus had finished sweeping up those fat flies littering the floor, the victims of daily pesticide spraying when he decided to go sit on his second-story apartment balcony and lazily flip through the classifieds. Not finding any jobs, he put the paper down, lit up a cigarette, and leaned back. Fuck it, he thought. I'll look tomorrow. It was 11 o'clock and he already wanted a beer. Marcus contemplated going to the refrigerator to get one when something caught the corner of his left eye. It was a girl. A teenager by the looks of her, wandering aimlessly down the sidewalk. Her bright orange tank top was what caught his eye. The thought of what was underneath held his gaze. She also wore a pair of cutoffs, and Marcus watched her legs as she sat down on the retaining wall in front of the library. Probably waiting on someone, he thought. He stood up, arched his back, and went into the house for that beer. In the kitchen, he took his time. He had drunk ten of the twelve-pack last night, contemplated waiting until later, and then convinced himself he would just drink the last two, since he'd have to leave to get more anyway. A big black roach the size of his thumb scurried under the refrigerator. Marcus watched it with bland indifference. He went over to the turntable flicked a couple of dead flies off the dusty plastic lid, and put on a Ramones record, turning the speaker so he would be able to hear it from out on the porch. He didn't think the neighbors would mind. He hadn't seen them for days. Grabbing a fresh pack of cigarettes from the carton on top of the refrigerator, he went back out onto the balcony, ready to do some heavy-duty lazing. He became nearly giddy with the prospect. This is what every American wishes he could do, Marcus thought. The girl was still there, looking this way and that like she was waiting for someone. Marcus drank her in, wondering if she even noticed him up there. He got up to change the record three times. He had smoked through half the fresh pack of cigarettes, finished up the second beer, and had to dip into the Johnny Walker Black. The girl never moved. Christ, he thought. She has to be bacon. But that wasn't all he thought. What he really thought about was the complete oddness of the situation. Ever since May, there had been two to three disappearances a week, which in a town like Green Grove significantly diminished the population. He knew many families, especially those with kids, had fled the grove. 
The police force, small to begin with, was depleted, but fear became the new law, exercising its control. As he sat there staring at the girl on the wall, it dawned on him that she was the first person he had seen outside in nearly a week. He hadn't seen any children or teenagers in probably a month. After another shot of scotch and a joint smoked with abandon on the small stoop, he decided it would simply be the neighborly thing to do to offer her a ride. Maybe she was in shock or suffering heat exhaustion or something. He pulled on a t-shirt and went downstairs, crossing the street in the midst of the lengthening shadows. Unlike a lot of girls in the grove, this one got more attractive the closer he came to her. Her body filled out the top and shorts, and Marcus put her age at 16 or 17, and at that point, his interests were solely prurient. She looked lonely. If, as he drew closer to her, he noticed a lazy eye and a hair lip, he would still have offered her a ride. Get the fuck away, she spat at him just as he was ready to open his mouth. Look, I was just going to offer you a ride. I don't need one. Fuck off. He thought about arguing, but as he opened his mouth, he realized he was way too hot, high, and drunk to go forward with it. Instead, he retreated slowly and cautiously back to his apartment where he shut himself up in the bedroom and turned the ancient window air conditioner up to its most frigid level. He made himself comfortable under the sheets and drifted off into some winter dreamland. When he woke up, he put a Miles Davis record on and went over to the balcony to take in the evening air and smoke. He opened the door and nearly tripped over the girl sitting on the balcony. Surprise ran through her eyes as she adroitly leaped to her feet. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know it was you, she said. It's okay. I don't know what your problem with me is. It was shady up here. It looked cool, all right? That's fine. You could have come in if you not. I have an air conditioner. And I'll tell you what my problem is. She wiped a sweaty strand of brown hair off her forehead. My problem is these disappearances. I've heard about those. I'm sure you have. Anyway, I really need to find out who's doing this. And I thought to myself, I'll just go stand someplace and mind my own business. And the first person who comes along and offers to give me a ride or any shit like that, that has to be the murderer. I don't quite understand your logic. So you think murderers are basically friendly people? And besides, how do you know they were murdered? They could have just run away, or been kidnapped or something, or gotten sick and been part of some government cover-up. I've thought about these things too, you know. No, they were murdered. She looked at a spot somewhere off behind Marcus, phasing out before snapping into the present and saying, Hey, give me a cigarette. How old are you? Look, burnout, I'm not a cop. Okay. You want some pot? I'm not a burnout either. Sorry. Marcus flipped a cigarette through the torn opening and held the pack out to her, taking one for himself. He was afraid she was getting ready to go and realized he kind of wanted her to stay. It was somewhat intoxicating just to be standing close to her, smelling her scent. How long had it been since he had talked to anyone except the old man at the carryout? So, he said, what makes you think these are murders? I know where the bodies are. Marcus <laughs> coughed out a sputtering spume of smoke. You what? I've seen the bodies. I've counted them. The paper said there's only been ten disappearances, but there's been a lot more than that. Like how many? Uncountable. You want to come inside? Bet you'd like that. I would. A lot, actually. You want to come in and sit down? You want to go for a ride? She said in a voice mockingly similar to his. Look, he said, that's weird shit. But even as he stood there rambling, thinking she was probably the crazy one, he knew he was going to say yes. He had to say yes because she was standing there in the damp night air. The nearly full moon illuminated just over the top and to the left of her head, casting an exotic purplish glow over her face. And there was this look in her eyes, something that made her seem either incapable of lying or so hypnotic that a small lie, even a huge one, didn't really matter. I'll be waiting down on the sidewalk, she said. He looked at the back of her neck. 
She had her hair pulled up, and he noticed she had a small mole to the left of her spine and just under her hairline. Marcus went inside and grabbed the keys. When he got down to the street, she was standing beside his truck. It's unlocked, he said. I'll drive. Do you have your license? No. Does it matter? He tried not to look at her. It was when he looked at her that his willpower seemed to break. She brushed a fly off her chest. Marcus tossed her the keys. Are you even 16? You seem to have this hang-up about age. I just have a hang-up about being arrested. Just relax. I've been wandering around all week and haven't seen a single copper. Where are these bodies? Do you know where Womack is? Womack's a long road. Which part of Womack? Out near County Line. Okay. She seemed way too small for the big truck. He enjoyed looking over at her seat, watching her leg muscles as she worked the accelerator and clutch. She had obviously driven before. They slid along all the backcountry roads, in between the deep high fields of corn, never passing another vehicle. Reaching Womack, they turned left. Womack was an amazingly straight road. That was the thing Marcus had always found interesting about this part of Ohio. One minute you might find yourself on a road with so many twists and turns, ups and downs, that it felt like Tennessee. Then the next minute it would be flat and straight as Kansas. So you've seen these bodies, huh? Yes. By the way, what's your name? Does it matter? Yeah, kind of. Unless you want to be remembered as that girl. Maybe I don't want to be remembered at all. God, you're difficult. My name's Ellen, okay? Relax. She had the truck up to 80, the old tires flapping away under the rusted body. So do you really think going back to look is going to solve anything? Maybe. Well, what are you hoping to find? The killer, for one thing. So you're hoping he comes back? So far, he's come back again and again. At first, I find two dead bodies. Then there are four. Then eight. And now... Think maybe you should have told the police? I told them after the first two. And they're still there? Go figure. I think you're fucking with me. I don't see much point in that. Maybe you're just taking me out here so you can kill me. Do you have a gun? He reached over and put his hand on the back of her shorts, knowing there wasn't a gun there. If there had been one, the shorts were way too small to hide it. She swerved the truck savagely to her right, dredging up the dirt shoulder and rolling him back to his side. Get the fuck off of me! She shouted. How do I know you didn't come along just so you could get me out here and rape me? More and more, it's starting to cross my mind. That's not even funny. Fuck you. Don't you even care that people are dying? Of course I care, but you have to understand how abstract this all sounds to me. You just seem crazy. Shut up. I mean, come on. You sit outside all day when it's like a hundred fucking degrees. I try to give you a ride and you tell me to get the hell away. Then I find you curled up on my porch and begging for a ride. After accusing me, in so many words, of being a murderer. I told you. It looks shady up there. And I don't beg for anything. Let's just go see the bodies. My name's Marcus, by the way. Oh. Oh? I don't care much for the name Marcus. Is that okay? Whatever. Ellen slowed the truck way down and came to a stop by the side of the road. She creaked the door open and hopped out. Marcus got out on his side and walked around the front of the truck. I don't see any bodies. The bodies are way back there. She pointed to a narrow dirt path, perhaps big enough for a tractor. If he had driven down the road with the corn this high, he wouldn't have even noticed it. You have to walk back this little path quite a ways. Just before the corn becomes the woods, there's like this clearing. That's where they are. Couldn't we have done this during the day? Why does he just leave them out in the open? It's not exactly out in the open back here, is it? Besides, most of those serial killer types want to get caught. You bring a flashlight? Did you find a flashlight when you felt me up back there? It's a full moon. What more do you want? Look, it's bright enough to see your shadow. It was amazingly bright. Ellen headed for the path and Marcus went behind her, watching the moon light up her body 
and trying to figure out how many months it had been since his last sexual encounter. He realized that by focusing on the prospect of sex, he relieved a little bit of the uneasy tension twisting his neck muscles up in knots. Why didn't we just drive back here? I didn't want to surprise anyone. How long is it? Probably almost a mile. How did you find this place anyway? She didn't answer immediately. He almost asked her again, thinking maybe the crispy rustle of the corn and the crickets had drowned him out. But then she said, Me and my boyfriend used to come back here. Oh, all that personality, and she puts out too. It was more than that. We were going to get married when we turned 18. This place was kind of like what we thought marriage would be like. You know, kind of a place away from the parents. A secret place? Yeah, or so we thought. Well, what happened to your boyfriend? He was the first to go. The first to disappear. I'm sorry. We should be quiet now. They continued down the moonlit path in silence for a few minutes. The clearing was now in eyesight. It was like driving toward the ocean and finally coming upon that strip of blue beneath the horizon. Follow me, Ellen said, cutting to her left and into the corn. At the perimeter, she turned and barked. Quickly! Marcus was suddenly and overwhelmingly filled with terror. Maybe it was just the fog of his various addictions, but he hadn't really taken any of this seriously until now. All the childish fears, those moments when certain feelings washed over him and lit that burning pit of dread in his stomach, all came scouring over him, rooting him to that narrow dirt path. He looked over to where Ellen entered the corn, and the absence of her by his side forced him to move. The corn was sharp and itchy on his arms. A hand reached out and took his. Come on. Ellen pulled him after her. Blindly, they made their way through the corn, still headed toward the clearing but comforted with a blanket of seclusion. Well, why don't we just run for the truck? Marcus thought about his sunny, music-filled apartment and realized he desperately wanted to be back in it. Ellen turned around, getting closer to him than she had been all evening. Her eyes were wild, dancing around in her head, an indiscernible color. I'm not turning around now. I have a lot more in this than you. If you're scared, then just stand here. That'll be safer than running back to your truck. But I'm going to some place where I can see that bastard throw another victim. I'm going to get close enough to see his face. Marcus lowered his head. He didn't have a macho streak in his body, but she had somehow made him feel low. He began to understand the significance this had for Ellen. I'll come. Then let's go. There was enough of a breeze so their movements weren't too noticeably loud. Nevertheless, the closer they felt they were getting, the more they slowed down and tried to squeeze between the stalks. Once they could see the clearing, they stayed back in the corn, using it like a security blanket. In the distance, Marcus saw the bodies. There was something infinitely sad about the way they were piled up there in the clearing. Knowing the answer, he turned to Ellen and whispered, Is that them? Gravely, she nodded her head and said, Let's move in a little closer. What about the killer? I don't see him. Well, that's obvious, Marcus thought. Stepping out of the corn was like losing your clothing. They were naked now. If there was a killer on the loose running around stark raven mad, they had little chance of hiding now. Running, maybe, but hiding was definitely out. Marcus followed Ellen. The grass in the clearing was worn down, as though it had been trampled quite a bit. Marcus thought it was probably from someone driving a truck out here. As they drew closer to the body pile, the stink intensified to a truly nauseating level. Marcus grabbed Ellen's arm. She turned to look at him, her stare pinning him where he was. Since coming out here, something had changed about her. She came off as a little flaky before, but now she just looked insane. I don't think I can get any closer. Marcus pulled his shirt up over the lower half of his face. Have some fucking respect, Marco. Ellen said, shaking his grip from her arm. Through the noisy insectoid country night, Marcus heard a singular sound resonate. The humming of flies. My God, there must be millions of them on those bodies. 
He even thought he could hear the wet squirm of the maggots twisting through decomposing flesh. His gorge rose and sat stinging at the back of his throat. I'm going to go wait in the truck, he said. Ellen turned to him once again. The craziness was gone. She had put on her seductive face. Pouty and girlish, it was the look she had used to get him to give up his keys. Come on, Marcus. It's just a few more steps. You'll get used to the smell. Why don't you tell me what we're really doing here, and I'll think about staying. But you're already thinking about staying, aren't you? Don't you know what we're doing here? We're trying to find the killer, remember? If that was the case, then why aren't we still hiding out in the corn? You can't catch anything by hiding. Nobody said anything about catching anything. I'm not a cop. Marcus looked into the heap arranged in a semicircle. It had to be most of Green Grove in there. Exposed to the elements, they had decomposed rapidly. Their skin gray, pieces of skin peeled back, probably the result of wild animals. All of them were rendered unrecognizable. Ellen wandered right up next to the bodies and dropped down onto her knees. What the hell are you doing? Can we just go? I'm saying a prayer. Can't I do that? Just hurry the hell up. Marcus turned around and looked up at the moon. What a night this was turning out to be. He turned back around and Ellen was back on her feet. Come here. I'd really rather not. I'll make it worth your while. Jesus, he muttered, thinking, I'm here anyway, aren't I? He slowly walked over to her and she turned, grabbing him around the waist, pressing herself against him. Her eyes gleamed with a wild urgency. He bent down to kiss her and leaned into the smell of a hundred rotten corpses. She fastened her mouth around his, trying to bring him down to the ground. His stomach fought to come up, and he put his hands on her hips nearly encircling her bare midriff to try and push her away. He felt the twitching of her skin like something was fighting to get out. Just when he couldn't hold the vomit anymore, he let go, but it was forced back into his throat. He <laughs> coughed and backed away, stumbling to his knees. Before he could stand up, his stomach convulsed again and he heaved, expecting the wet acid of his puke. Instead, he felt the flies crawling over his tongue and all around the inside of his mouth. He looked back at Ellen and the crumbling wall behind her. The corpses were animated. Ellen standing at their center, flies crawling through her hair, covering her eyes and body. Marcus bolted toward the corn, but the dead were there also. They had shifted, surrounding him. Flies crawled from their skin in hollow eye sockets, forming a cloud that blotted out the moon's glow. The circle tightened, and Marcus waited to feel their hands on his body. From behind him, Marcus heard Ellen whisper, You're the last one, Marcus. And he felt her hands. Hands that he would have welcomed a half hour ago slide down his stomach and crush his sex in an unforgiving grip. <laughs> what happens now? He begged. You taste death, she whispered. The killer is here, somewhere. Only he didn't kill just my boyfriend. He killed me too. What does that have to do with me? A soul is not free until his work is done. He made that clear. You're the last one. With that, Ellen snapped his neck and let him fall to the ground. It was a strange night that Marcus spent lying on the ground, his body getting colder, his heart inactive in his chest. By morning, he had joined the pile, becoming food for the flies as he remained still throughout the day. The next night, the dead rose again, dragging with them their veil of flies, and moved into the next town, each of them intent on doing what had been done to them.
hungry for some shred of justice. So, before we get started, let me get a few questions out of the way. It probably goes without saying, but I won't be providing the actual address of where the Harborview Motel is located in Texas, so don't ask. Like most urban legends of this nature, it's impossible to say for certain where it started or how it grew to be popular, so your guess is as good as mine on this. Although I will be providing you some step-by-step instructions on this ritual, please note that my experience is different than others, and therefore, if you do attempt this, there's no guarantee you'll fare the same. The Harborview is one of those mom-and-pop-owned motels that have survived the test of time thanks to its reputation for always having at least one room available. Some say this is because the owners do a terrible job cleaning up after their guests and can never have all rooms ready in case of a surge of bookings. Others claim it's because their budget is tight and the owners know that they don't get the usual clientele like other pit stops. That's likely due to the reputation of the mirror, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. The first thing you should know about the Harborview is that people don't come here for a good time or even a good night's rest. It's near to the highway and sits kitty corner from a 24-hour truck stop. Most business is taken over by the name-brand hotels a few miles down the road. No, people come here for a purpose. What that is will vary from person to person, of course, but for me it related to my wife Virginia. Six years she's been gone due to an overdose from drugs. Six years I've had trouble closing my eyes to go to sleep without conjuring up that last vacant stare she gave me when I found her. I've tried to figure out why she took her life, why she left me and the kids. I've blamed her job, blamed myself, and even blamed God. But it doesn't provide any real comfort. Her departure left a hole in my heart, a void that needed to be filled. I'm telling you this because of the first rule regarding the Harborview mirror. You need to have a reason for using it. Don't be some daft fool that comes here and wants to try something for shits and giggles. It won't end well for you, my friend. Of course, I can't say that with any degree of certainty either, because I don't really know if anyone's experience is better than mine was. I'm only giving you the same advice I was told to heed based on word of mouth spread across the Internet. That's where I heard, first, about the mirror. I made a menagerie of other articles about how to come to terms with grief by contacting the spirit of the one you lost. There's a multitude of them out there, but the mirror is the one that stuck out for me. Perhaps it was because it sounded so plausible, so tangible. The way people described it, and the way it affected them, surely that couldn't all be for the sake of make-believe. Six months is how long it took me to get the courage to give it a try. I knew that if I was going to succeed, I would need to follow the instructions given to the best of my ability. And that's the tricky part, really. There are at least 18 separate steps connecting to the mirror from what I've gathered, but some people put in a 19th or a different 13th step just to throw everyone off. Then another internet troll pops in and joins the bandwagon, distorting the original instructions more and more to the point where it's somewhat difficult to say for certain which are correct and which were simply tacked on. I can only tell you what I did, so please, if your experience includes steps that are different than mine, share that. First, you need to be from out of town. Easy for me, 
since I lived up in Amarillo, nowhere near to where the motel is located. Some say it has to be that you have never been there before or even anywhere near it. I can check that box easily, too, but I suspect many truckers and travelers cannot. Second, you should pack several things with you for the trip, the most important of which being a small pack of matches. This isn't for you, and you are not supposed to open them until prompted to do so. You can purchase them from anywhere, even from the truck stop across the road. The other items are a change of clothes, a door wedge, a black ballpoint pen, and a bottle of water. The next part isn't a step, really, but I think it holds some significance, so I'm putting it out there for good measure. It was around two in the morning when I arrived. This is important timing for later on, in step five, so I would simply advise that you arrive an hour or so ahead of time, just to give yourself time to finish your business and maybe grab a quick smoke or something. I walked into the truck stop to grab some Marlboros and beef jerky since I'd been on the road for a few hours. Like I said, I don't live nearby. And I was trying to find a good soda pop when the bright orange neon sign from the Harbor View came to life in the reflection of the Coke dispenser. As I noticed the sign come to life, a few of the other patrons in the store did too. So I figured I should chat up the locals and see what they had to say about the motel. I'm surprised they have money to keep that sign on. I remarked to the cashier as I passed her my cigarettes and snack. The young twenty-something didn't make a reply at first as she rang me up, but for the life of me, I swear there was something in her eyes that told me she had something to say. Isn't it run by just two people? Don't they ever sleep? I said hoping to goad her into a conversation. They come on when they're supposed to come on, she replied curtly. What does that mean? was my next inquiry. Owners know when they have someone coming by. Don't ask me how. They just do. Must be a traveler out tonight needing a place to rest their head. She said as she passed me the change and then asked me, What brings you here, stranger? Now, according to some blogs, this question is important to the ritual. Honestly, I don't see how. The cashier likely changes nightly, and there simply is no way they could always ask the same question. But it did unnerve me that she asked, and I felt compelled to reply truthfully. My wife, I'm hoping to see her tonight. I told the young girl as I stared at the lights at the Harborview Motel. It was like they were meant for me. Good luck, she told me. I went back to my car and checked the time, 2.24. Time to begin step three. You must leave your parked car at the truck stop and go on foot. Parking at the motel is bad luck, and getting a cab to take you there is worse, or so people say. There's an overhead walkway that links the truck stop to the motel, and the next step says you can use it to go to the harbor view or to return. But never both ways. It's up to you to decide. Even at this time of night, I didn't want to risk walking the six-lane traffic, so I made for the overhead. Once you're in front of the harbor view, it's time to wait. You should be there no later than 2.45, no earlier than 2.40. See, I told you timing was important. And since every version of the ritual mentions this, I'm doing it too. I arrived mere seconds before 2.45 hit, and I sat down on the second row of parking tape and looked toward the manager's office. The place seemed abandoned. No one ever comes here except people like me, searching for purpose in their life. This step is important, but then I guess all of them really are and it's going to require you to remain undistracted by the noise. The sign will say closed when you arrive, and you're to keep your attention on the sign until an unseen hand turns it over to open. This isn't easy, mind you. There's a lot going on. There are cars zooming by, 
Some even get into wrecks while you wait. Police sirens going off, helicopters flying overhead, the occasional prostitute trying to get your attention. Oh yeah, about that. This is a step I thought was fake. But since it happened to me, I'm including it. Some of the versions of the ritual say there's a particular prostitute that can appear while you wait. And while descriptions vary from account to account, one thing that is consistent is that she is supposed to be asking for a smoke. It happened to me about 3.09 as the minutes crawled by. I didn't hear her approach, and when she stood beside me I didn't smell any perfume. I was focused on the door, but in my peripheral vision, I gathered she was wearing stiletto heels and fishnet stockings with a short turquoise skirt and a skimpy top to match. The rules say she will be insistent on getting a smoke, and you must refuse her. And you must also keep your eye on the manager's window. I did both, despite the fact she was right in my ear, whining to grab a hold of my cigarettes. After writing this, it's occurred to me that this is likely due to me buying them in the first place, and hence her presence. So, if you want to avoid this distraction, just stay clean. I felt her tugging at my arm. She was very stubborn and wouldn't take no, or my ignoring her lightly. Finally, I came up with an alternate solution and offered her my food instead. Mighty nice of you, she said snatching the jerky from my hand. At that exact moment, the sign in front of me moved, and I felt my heart race. I wonder still if it was kindness that allowed me to move on to the next step. All I know for sure is that I left her there and moved with haste toward the door. The instructions say you can't take longer than a minute to get inside. If you do, you might wind up meeting someone besides the owner. I don't rightly know if I met that time, since I didn't look at my watch, but I can tell you the manager's office was not at all like what I expected. People say it appears to them in different ways. It's led me to think that maybe it's not simply the mirror that holds power, but the entire location. For me, it looked like a mashup between a Chinese restaurant and a video rental. Bland green and bright yellows mixed, Old wallpaper peeled from the ceiling. Jazzy, scratchy music played in the background. Incense filled the air. I couldn't really see the owner in the dim light behind the counter as he was busy grabbing something from under the desk. But he appeared to be short and stocky and of Asian descent. He took out a guest book, slid it across to me and said in broken English for me to sign in. Room he adds, pointing to the list. It's supposed to be a question, but for me it feels like a statement. These next few steps are supposed to be the easiest in the process that I figured it's impossible to get them wrong. Use the pen you brought with you. You sign in under an assumed name. You choose room eight. I think for most people, the ease of these is likely what throws them off. Everything up to this part feels like you could easily get it wrong and ruin the whole ritual. But how could you possibly fuck up these three? I didn't understand it until I was signing in, and you probably won't either. It was this overwhelming sense of disturbance in the air around me. A compulsion to write something, anything, anything, besides what the rule told me to put down. I had to practically force myself to forge a signature. When I was done, the Asian man smiled in a queer sort of way and put the book away. For the life of me, I wish I had seen how many other people had come here before, but in the heat of the moment, I must have panicked. Had my name been the only one? The owner told me to wait while I got the room key. I couldn't help but notice the scratchy music had stopped. In fact, the office was dead quiet. He returned a minute later with a large gold key tied to an even larger rusty copper plate that had an eight scrawled on it with permanent marker. It actually looked a little like an infinity symbol, 
though I don't know why that correlation came into my mind. The next step is supposedly optional. Like I said, some instructions don't include it, but others say you can tip him. Now, the rules do say you aren't supposed to bring any more than $44 to pay for the room and that you must insist on paying that amount, but the rest is up to you. I brought along about a hundred bucks for gas, food, and possibly HBO if it turned out the whole ritual was a dud, and this was all a stunt to boost their business, so I gave him a ten dollar tip. Per the script, the owner refused, and I insisted. Then I grabbed my key and made my way toward room eight. It should be after three thirty by the time you get there. Some people call this the witching hour. And as I walked toward the room, it certainly felt like it. Where once there was noise and distraction from the highway, now everything seemed quiet. Now would have been as good a time as any to say, fuck it, and go home. My purpose for coming told me I couldn't, though. So I used the key on the door and heard the lock grind as it unlatched from the hinges. Room 8 looks like someone threw up in it everywhere. You don't come for the scenery. It has gray carpeting with dark stains on it that some people claim are blood, and two twin-sized beds, both of which are made with peppermints on the pillow. The instructions say you're to choose the bed on the left, so that's what I did. I sat down and looked at the bed opposite me, my heart pounding as I realized I was actually going to go through with this. The door was still open, The rules don't specify whether you need to close it, just that you use the door wedge. But something about staring out into the world felt wrong. This place is separate from where I came, and I shouldn't let it interfere, I thought. So I closed it, placed the door wedge down, and went over to the bed again, taking a few short breaths. I told myself I was ready. People always do. I don't think anyone ever really has, though. Then I went to the bathroom and turned on the light. The mirror was waiting. Now, from an outsider's perspective, the mirror inside room eight looks no different than any other grimy, dingy motel would have. It takes up the whole wall, and it's got a few fingerprints and dust on it. It's even got a crack along the top, like one sharp hit could shatter the whole thing. I wonder how many people might actually come here for just a normal visit, stare into this mirror and go about their business without a care. It seemed unlikely because despite the fact that the mirror itself was ordinary, I felt uneasy about it. Something felt off. Don't ask me what. Maybe it was because I envisioned that the fingerprints were likely from the last person who came to perform the ritual. After all, the next step did say you were to sit in a chair in front of the glass and place your right palm against it. According to the instructions, you must do so within two minutes of the first time you're entering the bathroom. So don't go in to go potty or whatever. Go in to get this whole thing started. I sat and pressed my palm on the surface, feeling its cold resonate on my skin. You're told to hold your hand there for another minute, and while doing so, you should look toward the right-hand side of the reflection. Wait until you see the flicker of a candle. I must admit, I don't recall if there was a candle when I entered the bathroom. I was too focused on the mirror. I'm sure most people say the same. It's all-encompassing, unyielding, demanding of your attention. But after a few short, breathless minutes, I finally saw the candle ignited, and I abruptly seized my hand away from the mirror. The gentle flame from the wick lingered as I stared at it. My throat dry as I reached into my pocket and took out the matches. Getting this next part right was essential. You're to stand up, burn a match, and walk backward into the room. Keep your eyes on the flame and not on the mirror. My hands were sweaty when I struck the match against the box. It only took one try. I got up from the chair and immediately started walking backward. I didn't want to get anything wrong, 
so I was slow with my gait. I could see my reflection doing the same out of the corner of my eye, but again that dreadful, peculiar feeling lurched into my body. Why did it seem like the reflection was moving faster and I wasn't? I stopped right in front of the bed opposite mine. Then the match went out. At the same time, the candle did too. I stood there, looking toward the dark bathroom where my reflection had disappeared from sight, and tried my best not to shake. Everything had gone exactly according to plan so far. I knew I was to strip from my clothes and to change into the ones I brought with me. Some spectators say that this is so the spirit you meet is fooled and doesn't haunt you from beyond the room. Others claim it's because you're trying to appear differently than the way you came, so as to symbolize some sort of transformation you're trying to make. Personally, though, I wanted to get out of my regular clothes because I was soaked in sweat. Never had I been so nervous in all my life. It took me less than three minutes to get into the robe I'd brought, I figured something simple would be easier, but for some reason, putting it on felt like I was slowly drowning. All the while, I got the sense that the bathroom seemed darker than before. I was close to finishing all of the steps. Once dressed, I tossed my used clothes in haste over to my bed and reached for the matches. There wasn't a moment to waste. You're to start walking forward toward the darkness with a match ready. "'but you're not to light it until you're face to face with the mirror.' "'I took a tentative step forward, then another, then another. "'Finally I was there. "'The bathroom was colder than before, I was certain, "'and despite the fact that the mirror was only a few feet in front of me, "'I saw nothing. "'My hands trembled. "'I struck the match near my chest and closed my eyes.' saying the phrase I was told would provide me closure. "'Show me why,' I whispered. I held my breath for what seemed like an eternity, then opened my eyes and slowly brought the match up to my face. It was still me. My mind panicked, thinking I'd done one of the steps wrong. The ritual was meant to answer my fears, explain the loss I couldn't let go of. Was it all a hoax? Was this all a waste of my time? Then a smile creased across the features of my reflection's face. Silently, its free hand gestured toward the counter, where somehow there was a bottle of water on its side of the mirror. It was the one I'd brought with me, but I swear to you, the steps do not say to bring it into the bathroom. Somehow it was there anyway, across the void. Then it took the cap off the water and gently poured it over the match that was illuminating us both. Mine was the only flame that went out. In those few seconds of darkness, as I stared across my illuminated reflection, I can rightly say that I forgot what I looked like. It was like staring at a stranger. The reflection did not move or waver. It just stared back and held my gaze for another few seconds. It raised its mouth toward the glass and breathed gently, just enough to fog it up. Then it used its finger to write me a message. Slowly, I watched as the letters unfolded before me, my brain trying to comprehend what each of them was as though I'd never seen them before. It didn't seem to make sense until the word was spelled out in its entirety. Because, was all it said. Then the darkness returned. I sat there, numb, for a few long, lingering minutes. I thought back to Virginia and all the times we'd argued. The last things I said to her were cutting and harsh. That was why I'd blamed myself. So what did this message mean? This simple puzzle kept me awake the rest of the night as I lay in the bed. The rules say you don't have to stay until morning, but I had no idea where else to go. I think I know what the mirror was telling me, and I think I understand now why the ritual is not recommended. 
why my answer may not be so unique after all. The morning light is creeping into my door, but it isn't welcoming. The roar of the traffic is all that buzzes into my mind. I can leave whenever I want to. The ritual is over. This here, for anyone else who's listening to these stories and searching for answers of their own to whatever is keeping them up at night. I'm telling you, if you are searching, you should stop doing so. Because sometimes bad things happen, and there's nothing you can do about it. And that's a hard pill to swallow. Maybe even impossible if you realize the deeper implications. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe your experience will be different when you come to the Harborview Motel. All I know is that I have to cross the highway, and I can't go back the way I came. Wish you were here. Tell us a ghost story, said one of the women, the pouty one, the one named Melissa. She was the nice, friendly one, for now, the one asking questions, the one who wanted to stop at every little roadside fruit stall and pose next to every possibly rabid monkey. But Damas knew this kind of tourist. Eventually, she was going to exhaust herself. And then, fueled by a high metabolism and the vengeance of unmet expectations, she was going to become his worst enemy. That was why he was counting on the other woman, Rose, to keep the group stable when they reached their breaking point, which was probably going to be on day three. He could already tell that both Melissa's and Rose's men would be useless. For now, however, the tour was still in its honeymoon phase. Melissa was still excited, leaning out of the seatbelt that Demas had forced her to buckle. Rose's man, Ben's cell phone, was still fully charged, and Melissa's man, Josh, was still full from breakfast, too. Rose was... Well, it was hard to tell how she was, sitting in the back row and not having spoken the whole morning except to say that she and her husband had slept... fine. So... Rose was fine. It goes study, eh? Dimas glanced over at his driver, Newman, who shrugged. Well, here is a study. An army unit is sent to a remote village in the middle of the jungle in order to move the villagers to a new settlement that's, uh, less remote. They need the land for an army base, but the villagers have lived there for a hundred years. And even though the government offered to buy the land, many times they always refused to go. So the army drives up to the village in the middle of the night. They go to the first house on the main road. Nobody home. They go to the second house. Nobody home there either. Third house? Nobody home, said Ben. Right, nobody home. So the soldiers look at each other and say, Where is everyone? Did they evacuate? Why did they leave all their belongings? Then suddenly they realize one of their men is missing. All that's left is his head. The soldiers panic. They're shooting at shadows, but it doesn't help. One by one. They are all killed by something they can't quite see until finally there is only one soldier left and he is out of bullets. He squats down by a chicken coop, closes his eyes and prays to Allah as he hears something come out of the darkness. He breaks open the chicken coop and throws a chicken screaming, Take it! There's a big crunch, and so he looks, and it's a woman, except she's got claws on her hands and feet, and her eyes are yellow. She is a tiger woman, 
Of course, the soldiers start running back toward the trucks. Except this time, all the houses are full. The villagers are home. And they are eating his comrades. Demis laughed uncomfortably. Neoman shot him an odd look. It was indeed an odd story to tell, one he would never have told two months ago. It involved soldiers dying. But, in this new, rapidly reforming world, this spinning, twisting lump of mud, nothing was off limits. Or so he gathered from the drivers who blasted through Jakarta's red lights, yelling, Reformasi! For at least 30 seconds, the tourists said nothing. And then Josh, who had wasted no time telling everyone that he had already been to the island twice and he knew all its ins and outs, said, That's not really a ghost story, is it? Nima stared over his shoulder at Josh, his plastic work smile stretched across his mouth like the surgical masks that Japanese tourists like to wear. You're right, he said. It is not. Josh, clearly uncomfortable, smiled back, almost in spite of himself. Then Rose spoke. So, what happened? Her voice was flat as the banana leaves slapping the windows of the van. Did the government leave them alone? Well, no. The army came back with helicopters and sprayed the village with napalm until everyone left. It's an army base now. Without warning, Neomon swerved violently to the right, unleashing a barrage of screams from the Americans. Dimas jammed his fingers against the window to protect his head. Josh spilled his iced coffee, and Ben became very upset about what this traumatic maneuver might have done to the apparently breakable rose. Sorry, Neomon said in exaggerated English, and then added, staring meaningfully at the moss, Animal ran into the road. They paid the security guard 80,000 rupiah each to enter the historic broken temple complex. Last month, it would have been 70,000. And four months before, it would have been 40,000. The security guard kept it close to triple the cost of a bowl of noodles. One for each of his children. The Americans had no idea and didn't complain. The dollar was monstrously in their favor, after all. As the five of them trudged toward the ruins, Neomon stayed in the van, partly to keep it from being stolen and partly because he would rather read the sports page and fantasize about the World Cup. Rose hung back with Demos and asked, Do you know a way to contact the dead? Demos tried not to cringe as he squinted at her. She was hard to read behind those giant sunglasses. Why, ma'am? My son died in a car accident, she whispered. I just want to know he's all right. Gutot, who ran the travel agency from a tiny office in Kuta, said that he had never before seen so many fever-dreaming grief tourists as were sleepwalking through Bali today. Most had lost parents or siblings through plane crashes or cancer. They were good for business because even the ones that didn't buy extensive reality-delaying package tours, like Rose's group, bought souvenirs and memorabilia and other things that they could wrap up and keep safe and take home with them, unlike the people they had lost. It is because they think we are dying too, Gatot said, and then defiantly snuffed out his cigarette on his own desk. We'll just see who dies first. He's all right, ma'am. For sure. He is all right. But how do you know? A mosquito landed on her arm and deliberately sucked her blood. I read about something that you have here. Jilang Kung? Am I saying that right? He shook his head, watching her blood travel from flesh to insect belly. He had played with Jilang Kung. 
Bonnie's grandmother had showed them how, tying half a coconut shell to a pair of crisscrossed, rag-draped wooden sticks. Give the ghost some respect, her grandmother explained. At least, give it a head. He also knew that a tourist would not have found the game unless actively searching for ways to contact dead. Bad idea, ma'am. I thought we were supposed to get the full experience, Rose said. She had stopped walking, forcing him to pause as well. And by the way she was throwing out her arms, jangling her wooden bracelets, she was frustrated. I thought anything was on the menu. That's what we paid for, isn't it? No holds barred? All inclusive? Complete access bullshit? Right? He suddenly became conscious of a pain in his palms where his nails were digging. Ma'am, Jilong Kung isn't like a person-to-person telephone call. It's like taking a megaphone and yelling, Hey, spirits, come find me. Maybe your son answers. Maybe someone else. Maybe it's not like this in America, but over here, it's very, very crowded on the other side. Rose took a deep breath in preparation for another rant, then, apparently, changed her mind and went hurrying up the hill with a new and soldierly determination. Dimas followed, trying to stop himself from shaking his head. At the crest, they looked out upon the broken temple complex, scattered across the bright green like a giant child's failed attempt to build a block tower. Dimas searched his pockets for his notes, because he didn't know anything about any of this. As a Javanese, all he knew about this island and its people was how good they were at cultivating an exoticism. Just wild enough, without being savage. The rest of us can handle savage. For Australians to fawn over. At the bottom, Melissa was waving enthusiastically. Ben shouted something at Rose. He was pointing at one of the little half-fallen candy stupas. It was no bigger than a hand. On the hill, his wife was looking elsewhere, at the line of enormous trees that had been continuously beaten back by skitters and diggers. And before that, fires and souls. With his pulse pounding after the hike up the hill and Rose's demand and the thought of Ani's grandmother and the Jelong Kung, the trees seemed to be trembling. Ben didn't know that his wife wasn't watching, and he moved toward the stupa in large, grandiose steps, like an astronaut walking on the moon. Dimas was about to yell at him not to walk carelessly on the stupa when Ben suddenly slipped from view with a yell that roused birds from the trees. Tell me a ghost story. Ben hadn't spoken since he was told that he'd be bedridden with a broken leg for the next two months and Melissa and Josh had to leave because they started arguing over the merits of alternative medicine. And Rose announced that she was taking a walk to get some sweet, polluted air. Ghost this time. No monsters. The quiet, pretty nurse adjusting Ben's IV widened her eyes and smiled. In the next bed over, behind a thick green curtain, a wheezing patient stirred in their bed. All right, said Dimas, who tried to focus on summoning his pity for Ben. A boy moves to a new city to go to university. He thinks he's very lucky because he rents a room in the house that's quite close by, just two street blocks away. The most direct route to his house is down the wide stretch of street that, for some reason, never seems to be very crowded. The buildings on either side are either abandoned or under construction. Taxis and Bikak don't use the road. It is very strange, he thinks. He walks down the path a couple of times in daytime and doesn't see anything peculiar. But most of the time, he tries to avoid it, just like everyone else. 
Garçon. One night, he is at the university very late because he has exams. He's trying to study. And the electricity goes on and off at his house. Finally, he packs his things when he can't stay awake anymore. And, as he leaves campus, decides that he can't be bothered to take the long way around to his house. So, he takes the direct route. The first thing he notices is that the strange fog is just sitting in the street, like a landed cloud. The second thing he notices is that there's a figure in the fog ahead of him. A crying, bloody man in rags. The boy has enough sense to know this isn't good, so he tries to swerve around the man. Except the man then appears again, right in front of him, weeping, Help me. The boy doesn't say anything, picks up his pace and feels someone grab him from behind. It is a woman this time, with her eye gouged out, saying, It hurts. The boy pushes her off and runs straight into a body that doesn't even have a head. Just arms reaching out to take hold of him. Eventually, he just begins to pray as he runs and eventually the ghosts stop coming so close. And he's able to run the rest of the way home. When he gets home, he asks his old landlord, who is smoking a cigarette on the porch what that street is. The landlord says, Oh, that's where they killed communists in this city in 1965. They dumped the bodies in the gutter. Tell me, boy, what did they say to you? And the boy says, Well, I think they were asking me for help. And so the landlord leans forward and says, They will need it in hell. It wasn't a very good story, but Dimas didn't know how else to finish it. He had heard iterations of the story from several friends of friends over the years, always about a neighborhood that no one seemed to know of, and that cold razor wire line had always been the ending. Ben didn't care because he was asleep from all the pain medication he'd requested, but the nurse was staring at DeMoss incredulously. There's a road like that where I'm from, too, she whispered. But why would you go and tell him? He doesn't understand what it was like. Neither she nor DeMoss would have been old enough to have any real memory of 1965. But she wasn't talking about that. She was talking about institutional genetic knowledge. The amorphous plasma that stitched acquired data together into one cohesive, rational narrative. You wanted the ghost story, Dimas said with a shrug. That the one has a lot of them. Half an hour later, the Americans reconvene for a team meeting in Ben's room. Ben was still unconscious and they didn't want to disturb him, they said, but apparently they needed his body to be their non-voting witness. Rose sat down near the bed and silently held Ben's hand, and DeMoss started to excuse himself. But she stopped him with a set of cool fingers pressed persistently to the spot where his pulse hit his wrist. We've decided to go on with the tour, she said. Her voice was utterly without affect. Behind her, Melissa and Josh were uncomfortably squirming, sucking mango soda from straws. Where do you think we should go next? Demas purposefully sat at the end of a row of folding chairs, provided a quick exit if needed, and allowed the three Americans to hopefully talk amongst themselves. And thank God that Melissa, not Rose, demanded to sit next to him, 
so she could ask him as many questions as possible about a dance he knew nothing about. But he had his notes, so he tried to explain to her the story of the stolen princess, her avenging husband, and the demon king. Oh, and the warrior monkeys, of course, which made Melissa's eyes gleam. Every so often, Josh would interject, mostly to show that he could. Meanwhile, he could feel Rose staring coldly at him through both of her friends. Take a picture of us, Melissa said, slipping her little black camera into Dimas's hand and then leaning back into Josh. Rose, are you in the picture? Rose had to lean forward to get into view. Her look, naked in its resentment, was so awful that DeMoss didn't even wait for Melissa to say, Bally high, before snapping the picture. He gave Melissa a thumbs up. His plastic smile was starting to ache. After the kakak performance started, the audience of foreigners and wealthy natives, all from Jakarta, of course, no locals, prepared their cameras. As one chanticleer led a call and response around a fiery torch, the hundred male performers sitting in concentric rings on the ground shook as if inhabited by the splintered spirit of a cackling gecko god, arms outstretched, fingers frantically twitching. Demos wondered how it felt, pretending to be possessed every sundown. He imagined them on their smoking break, sneering at tourists while they argued about where to buy shabu. The fire leapt as Australian winds brought the night in, and the heavily made-up princess, legs wrapped so tightly that she seemed to have the lower body of a goldfish, began to skulk amongst the men. Ani had died in a fire. At least he assumed so, based on the charred remains of her family's convenience store. He told her to leave. He'd even told her to leave the city the day after the students were shot in the street. But she dawdled, froze, as if she wanted it to end this way. Ani did talk fatalistically about the fate of the nation after the IMF deal was made and Parliament re-elected the general for the seventh time. Nothing ever changes, she said. But then... They suddenly, violently, did. Fiery beams fell between them, and smoke filled his lungs, and he couldn't wait any longer. What was he supposed to do? And why did she have to raise her eyes and look at him just before he turned his face toward his jacket, as if finally waking up from a deep sleep? Down in his gullet, Amidst the muddy guilt and the true, deep sadness that Allah knew he felt for the loss of Ani's life, lived the deep-seated fear that Ani's last moments on Earth were drowned in the sort of bitterness that left a permanent stain. Something was shaking beside him. He looked first at the dancers. The Demon King had emerged from behind a brick wall and caught sight of the princess, eyes on fire, and then at Melissa, who was the source of the tremors. Demas thought at first that she was shivering, but when he saw her chin warbling and her eyes rolling back into the gulf of her skull and a small trail of saliva running down her chin, he knew this was worse. Then she slipped off her chair, falling onto a group of French tourists in the next row. For a spare second, in the desperate, dark moment that followed, Josh trying to control his seizing wife, Rose screaming at everyone to give the woman space, and the other tourists and all the dancers paying them no mind at all, kak, kikak, kikak, kakak creating the unnerving sensation that the four of them had somehow fallen through a trap door past their waking world and into the next. Melissa's blue eyes focused. Those eyes looked at Demos and Rose and maybe Josh as well. And it was not Melissa looking out. No, it was not. 
their ears plugged like passengers of a falling airplane. And then, they were not alone. But ten seconds later, her eyes had rolled back again. The world righted itself. And now there was a German doctor on holiday, holding up two fingers, and a woman in a hijab offering a dripping bottle of water with an unbroken seal, and a possum-eyed kakak dancer, leaning down and asking, She is on drugs, yeah? another ghost story, said Josh. The scariest one you know. Melissa put her head in her hands and whined. I am tired of ghost stories. But Josh didn't even look at her. And Rose just pushed a glass of ice water in her direction, telling her she should stay hydrated. Melissa pushed it back so forcefully that Dimas reached his hand out to catch it. Jesus Christ, Rose she snapped. I am not your kid. Rose looked at her sourly. Josh took another tortured sip of Bintang beer and raised his eyebrows at Dimas. Well, you got one that'll make me shit my pants or what? I have a study, said Dimas. Melissa started making a strange animal noise between a growl and a whinny. Before Ani died, she used to say that she would haunt him if one of his stupid adventures got her killed. They were never all that dangerous, just rope bridges and speeding motorbikes and haunted hallways. But they liked to play pretend. And Ani would lean in and say, If I don't make it, I will come back to get you. Melissa, who was supposedly all better now, sat like a limp doll on the bench beside him. Her jaw slightly slack as she stared ahead into the street at the humming mass of travelers moving slowly in the half-light. A pregnant woman, Nimas started, then took a deep breath and began again. A pregnant woman is tossing and turning in her bedroom in the middle of the night. She has been sick. She doesn't know what time it is, just that it's dark, and she should be sleeping. But the lights in the living room are still on, and her mother-in-law asks her through the door if she's hungry. No, thank you, she says. What about some water? No, she doesn't want water either. How is she feeling? Is she cold? And the pregnant woman finally says, loudly this time, I don't need anything. So, then her husband comes in the room and wants to know who she's shouting at. Because his mother's not due to arrive until the next morning. So, now, the woman knows that she's being chased by a Kuntalanak. That's the name of the ghost. Everyone here knows what it is. She's the ghost of a woman who died in childbirth and is searching for babies and the blood in the afterlife. A group of sunburned, middle-aged Australians burst out laughing or crying next to them. It was hard to tell which. They had their own tragedies, their own demons to run from. Damas looked back at his own cohort, but only Rose met his gaze. Melissa was humming along to Hotel California, which had started playing over the club lizard speaker system for the sixth time that night. Josh was finally looking at Melissa, scorn mixed with longing. So, the woman gets a pair of scissors from the bathroom and goes back to bed with the scissors clenched in her hand. She goes to sleep. It is still dark when she wakes up again, and there's a sap leaning down over her. And because she's a brave woman, she stabs it right where she's supposed to, in the back of the head. The creature falls, and she turns on the light and realizes it is her husband. 
And not only has she killed him, her beloved, the father of her child, but now she is alone with the Kuntalanak. Rose stared at him in hurt and shock. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw that Melissa had struck up a conversation with a man in snakeskin sitting next to her. He didn't seem to be a part of the Australian group. I, I'm sorry, Dimas whispered. I don't know why I picked that study. I have an idea for a scary story, said Josh. How about if you talk about what's going to happen to this country once it splits into 27 pieces? How about that? What happens when all these fucking people... He waved his beer around, even though two-thirds of the people in Club Lizard were tourists realize that they don't have to worry about the military reining them in anymore. Why don't you give us a prediction for how fast things are going to burn down once the inmates are running the asylum? Demas wondered if Josh had perhaps forgotten that he could speak English. He thought of Gatot's defiance. We'll just see who dies first. And forced himself to smile at Josh. He could see Melissa getting up and walking away with her new friend. Rose, sitting in the dark, slowly opening and closing a pair of scissors. Ben, eaten alive by mosquitoes in the hospital. And he saw himself in his sordid and bloody hometown, running through empty streets toward what used to be Chinatown, toward the burning building where he knew Ani would be waiting. Hopefully, by the time the world ends, you'll be gone, he told Josh, who didn't respond because he had just now realized that the woman he'd walked through customs with, walked down the aisle with, was slipping quietly away into slippery anonymity, fallen down a crevasse in the known world. It happens all the time. No one knew what dim, damp alley Melissa had disappeared into, and Josh was too angry to care. Fuck her, he said. She does this all the time. Remember Rio? She'll come back when she runs out of cash, the bitch. He kicked at a stop sign, covered in missing persons flyers for tourists who had largely lost themselves at will. We love you. We miss you. Please come home. As they ambled back to the hotel, Rose tried again. Please help me talk to my son, she begged. I know you can. I know you know how. Demas glanced at her and thought he saw something scuttle in the gutter behind her. Something that cast an uneven, shuddering shadow on the heavily graffitied wall. Bad idea, ma'am, he said again, staring at the glittering sidewalk coated with dew and vomit. I told you, he died so fast, Rose said. Ben was driving, country road, we were coming back from a baseball game. Something happened, I don't... I don't... She stared at a glowing red sun sign ahead of them for Bounty Discotheque something in the road. They said he didn't suffer, but I didn't have a chance to say goodbye. I'm sure he's scared. He was, he was such a little scaredy cat. Demas spun around, cutting her off. Mr. Yoss! His voice came out sounding very weak, very raw. The one thing Godot always pressed beyond comfort and satisfaction and legality was liability. Keep your group together. He had been thoroughly scared by a recent incident in which an Australian dive boat had left two divers behind to be eaten by sharks at the Great Barrier Reef. And here, Demos had already lost Melissa. 
Mr. Dios, I think we should hurry back to the hotel. But Josh had stopped near a clump of skinny teenagers huddled on the stoop of a shuttered scuba store. He had his wallet out and was very conspicuously taking out stacks of weathered rupia. Loon, Demos whispered, but didn't step in. Why risk it? He wasn't going to end up in Hotel Kurabokan for anyone, especially not a fucking tourist. He counted to ten, trying to still his nerves and the sense that something besides motorcycle exhaust and patchouli was swirling around them, until Josh stuffed a little plastic baggie into his back pocket and sullenly resumed walking. You could never sleep in the dark, said Rose. But neither can I. Shapes look different. A local girl in garish theater makeup stumbled out of bounty, followed by an anxious looking man three times her age. Melissa! Josh screamed at the call girl, who looked over her shoulder at him and sneered. Go home, you wanker! Her companion shouted. Josh slapped his hand on the hood of a nearby car, thank God no alarm, and shouted back, Oh, come make me! It was a bad idea from the start. Cops were never very far away from Bounty, and these days they, like everyone else in the country, were teetering on a knife's edge. Too many stories about docile village mobs decapitating bus drivers who ran over small children can make a policeman twitchy. Even the Deox, supposedly beaten into submission decades ago, had come out of the jungle and set locking equipment on fire. What's a cop to do? Couldn't trust anybody anymore. Not even two drunk westerners who would have been sent home to their hotels in the good old days. The British man and the call girl eventually teetered away down Yalan Lejean, but when the cops found ecstasy in Josh's pocket, that was it. Some chlorine-stained kids in sporty beachwear came out of bounty to point and laugh, but Damas hurried Rose away to the growling sound of what Damas could only hope was thunder, rolling down from the highlands. Tell me a ghost story. A real one this time. He wanted to tell her that they had all been real. Or might as well have been. He could have told a thousand other anecdotes about mysterious lights and strange coincidences and unexplained illnesses and visions of the dead passengers seen by only half the bus. But they had wanted stories, hadn't they? Stories with a setup and an escalation at the terrible, brutal denouement. This is the last one, he said, and meant that, because there was a more than decent possibility that he would not make it to the final day five. He had seen another humanoid shadow while brushing his teeth the night before, and then found the window to his third floor apartment open, and the drapes dancing, and he knew they were being hunted. Correction, he was being hunted, and Allah had sent Ghost Seeker Rose to Gadot's tropical adventure tours in order to let him know that it was time to buck up and stop running from his faint soldier. Damas was driving this time. He told Neoman where they were going, a huge unfinished Bali Grand Hotel. Neomon had laughed in his face and demanded double a day's pay to make the drive, which Demos didn't feel like asking Rose about. Rose was cradling the hodgepodge shopping bag of Jilung Kong's component parts. Two broomsticks, half a coconut, permanent marker, incense, twine, a Superman shirt because her son's favorite character was Superman paper stolen from the hotel room on her lap as if they were the very bones of her child. My friend, 
My best friend died in a fire, along with her father and grandmother. Some people, he shook his head, what to call them? Psychopaths? Murderers? He had run the streets alongside them, silent while they yelled. Some very angry people set fire to the store. I was in there with them, trying to convince them to leave the city because I could see it coming. Not the fire, of course, or the riots. But once the fire started, I knew what would be burned. His lips quivered. I got out because I didn't wait. I was scared, you know. I thought I was going to die. I convinced myself that she'd follow if she saw me running. I thought she'd make it out. I stood outside the building for ten minutes, I think, waiting for her. And, and she didn't make it. He glanced back at Rose through the rearview mirror. She didn't make it. And ever since, I've been afraid of seeing her. Around campus, on the street. Even in a room full of people, I can't look at faces too closely. Because I left her, you see. Because that sort of betrayal leaves uh, a mark in the world. Like a cigarette burn. I got so scared that I couldn't leave my house, but even then I could feel someone sitting on the couch and just looking at me. That's why I decided to leave Jakarta. Just being near those buildings, I, c I couldn't. I, I could feel her spirit, her energy. There was a small white mass in the road ahead that he realized in a few moments was a goat. He slowed to a stop, hoping the engine roar would scare it into moving, but its milky eyes barely registered the vehicle. Sighing, he kept his foot on the brake. He contemplated telling her that after a few lonely months, Ani had apparently found him again, bringing with her the shadows the whispers, the cold sensation of being under someone's eye. The hazy cloud of a spirit's hug, the sick and the gut feeling of hovering by a bungee cord over the gaping maw of the great unseen world. But when he opened his mouth, he was too afraid to say the words out loud. Rose's voice had softened when she spoke next. I know what that's like. After your son died? Even before that. It got stronger after Connor died, but... I'd felt it for a long time. A presence. That feeling like even when you're alone in a locked room, you're never alone. Then she chuckled and wiped a tear out of the corner of her eye. Then always called it my guardian angel. I think he was just trying to make me feel better. But I've been thinking that maybe he's right. Who's to say it's not a guardian angel? Who's to say your friend's angry at you? Maybe she's just watching over you. The goats mind her. An old man with a long beard came out of the bushes and pushed the goat along with a few swats of a small stick. The old man flashed a black-toothed smile at their van. No, not quite at the guilt-eaten man at the wheel, nor the mournful woman in the back seat. But it's something just behind them. Something... That must have been beautiful. I'd be angry, was all Damas said. 
The Bali Grand would have been horrific had it been allowed to live. It was gaudy, too heavy and too white, and far too marbled for the gentle green hills it was nestled in. The general's son had signed off on the final design after an extended stay at the casino hotels of Las Vegas. Thankfully, the project ran out of money during the financial crisis, leaving the hotel unfinished with its very bones exposed, like the broken open jaws of a long-dead giant. Rumor was that the general's son still lurked somewhere amongst the pillars and arches, and that was bullshit. Everyone knew he was hiding in Europe, in a premium suite of a hotel he hadn't designed. The Bali Grand was still horrific now, but for different reasons. Under the flapping tarps and abandoned construction equipment, it was undoubtedly haunted. If not by the dead workers, then by the ghosts of offshore private loans and weakly regulated banks. Dumas and Rose went to the partially constructed lobby where tile floors had been laid and a patchwork roof had been erected to build their conduit, the Jalong Kung. Then, they leaned the doll against the wall to watch them eat their martabak and wait for night to fall. Nothing happened the last time Dumas played this game with Ani and a couple other jokers at school. No one had been expecting anything, of course. They were just bored and trying to take their minds off exams. They gave the coconut shell a googly face and asked the oxygen molecules in the cigarette smoke whether they would pass their tests. Nothing turned into their antenna. But this time, as Dumas led Rose in a shaky overture to the spirit world... He felt that he was practically inviting Ani, whatever was left of Ani, to come forward. Dimas saw Rose holding the wooden creature, turning the broomstick body gently in her hands like one of those hunched-back beach women who traverse the littered coastline, hawking umbrellas and massages and temporary tattoos, and closed his eyes. Imagined the peace of the sea. He only opened them after he felt the pressure in the room plummet, as if an anchor had dragged him and Rose and the Bali Grand Hotel ten meters below the surface. With tensed muscles and an aching top row of teeth, he expected to see Ani levitating above the Jelong Kong with peeling skin and denouncing eyes. But though the darkness had grown touchably thick beyond their struggling candlelight, he saw nothing. Just Rose. Gagging. When something lodged in her throat. Miss... Miss Rose? Miss Rose, are you alright? Rose was not fine. At that moment, Rose was a broken vase, and someone, some thing that wasn't Rose, came spilling out of her like a gush of tar and slithered across the floor. No, not Rose, also not Ani. And he was willing to bet the value of Rose's all-inclusive tour package that no matter how badly Rose wanted it to be, that it wasn't Rose's little boy, Connor, either. The oily shadow crawled across the floor, wrapped itself around the Jelong Kong, and held it upright when Rose's grasp failed. It drenched the Superman shirt, and twirled the permanent marker dangling from the broomstick's arm. Rose whispered, Connor? Sweetie? Is that you? 
The Jelong Kong was supposed to tip and use the pen to mark a yes or no on the paper. It did lean in at first, and then it started shaking. Violently. It was almost like a head shake. No, no, no. But then, with a terrifying bang and a howl from the ends of the earth, the wooden body flew apart. One broomstick nearly hit Demas in the temple, and a shredded piece of the Superman shirt landed in Rose's lap. Like a taunt. Meanwhile, the shadow spread, covered the ceiling beams and dripped down the unpainted walls. Occasionally, its edges would curl together and form the shape of a man, or a cow, or a tiger. Shapes look different. Wasn't that what Rose said? And then it would flatten out and seep to another corner of the room. Though it had hitched a ride with Rose, this shadow didn't know sadness. It was more primitive than that. It was just hungry. It lay so oppressive on their fragile human souls simply because it was not human. And never had been. By then, Demas had slid over to Rose so he could quietly urge her to say goodbye, to end the ritual. She was feverishly muttering something, something about Connor and a number of other things Demas couldn't identify. And he had to lean in close. Miss Rose, you have to close the door. This only made her whisper more frantically, clenching the Superman rag to her chest. Miss Rose, close the door so we can drive away. We can go to Kuta, see your husband. Can't leave it. Did she mean the presence? I can't leave. Every human cell in his body wanted to leave because it knew this feeling and wanted to survive. This thing had come to this country wrapped around Rose's skeleton. It wouldn't have chased him. He'd have gotten away. Yet he helplessly sank to his knees as if his feet were lodged in mud. On his legacy, he supposed because that was when he finally felt her outside of her normal Jakartan habitat. The same electric seizure he'd feel when pedaling past her blackened building, or the empty, tortured malls, where they used to fantasize about a someday life of large televisions and luxury brands. He imagined her putting her arms around him, pulling him down, saying, stay, not meanly, not hatefully, but honestly. Keep your eyes open this time, scared the cat. Here it comes. A red and black centipede crawled across to Moss's hand, down to the dark concrete valley and then onto the denim of Rose's jeans. Damas, who'd woken up to the sound of rain, nudged her. Rose didn't react. He could feel the chill emanating from her body. He shifted to get a better look at her and confirmed the sick feeling in his stomach. She was dead. Eyes open. Jaw slightly slack. Heart attack? Theft of the soul? He didn't want to touch her, but knew if he didn't close her eyes now, then she would definitely roam the earth forever. Very cautiously, he crossed the empty expanse of the hotel lobby, watching for shadows or drops in atmospheric pressure, or noises of any kind. Nothing but the rain gave him goosebumps. He ran to the van, not bothering to shield his head. 
He told the first cops he could find, two boys who probably should have been guarding a mall in Den Pasar. For some reason, conditioning maybe, they believed his story and promised to go up to the Bali Grand just as soon as the rain cleared up. Then, Demas drove back to Kuta. He thought about checking on Ben at the hospital or Josh at the prison, but decided not to do either. Not yet. He didn't even know where he'd find Melissa. If he'd find Melissa. Probably in the crime and punishment section of the Bali Post. So, instead, he went to see Freddy, a tattoo artist who specialized in painting visions of the bug-eyed, toothy barong, the good spirit king. Freddy welcomed him in and sat him down in front of the television. On the table were video cases of Freddy's favorite horror movies, a plastic mess of red eyes and long black hair and frightened, stupid teens. Damas thought of The Forgotten, the legendary ghost story that the censorship board locked up years ago on account of being cursed. Rumor had it that a real ghost had been caught on camera during filming, and that a critic had died of a heart attack during an early screening at Pondok Inda Mall. He didn't remember what it was about anymore. Something about a dead witch and a secret room. Tell me a ghost story. Hey, did you ever track down The Forgotten? You know, the uh, accursed movie? Freddy laughed. <laughs> Why? You want to watch it? I did find it, my friend, but it was nothing special. Turns out it was burned because the movie didn't have any ki come in to beat up the evil spirits by the grace of Allah. He handed Demas a bowl of cup noodles. Can you believe it? <laughs> so stupid. But at least we can watch all the shitty movies we want now, eh? After Reformasi? Demas wasn't convinced that the little vice president currently on television would change the rules of the censorship board, but he had been wrong before. Right now, the little vice president was forbidding the sort of language that had gotten Ani killed for being Chinese, for not being a true daughter of the land. So, there was that. Freddy sat down at the couch with his own cup noodles and switched to the jittery black of Channel 4, where a movie was already playing. A lady ghost in a white shift was moving without weight through a foggy cemetery. If it started with her, it would end with her. She'd been terribly wronged. She would be avenged. I think I did something... Terrible, the Moss said. Freddy sighed. Ah, you need to forgive yourself, Moss. She's not going to come all the way back here just to forgive you. She has better things to do now, right? She's at peace. Let her go. A stray memory flickered of Ani snorting iced tea out of her nose at something he'd said about a teacher. I don't mean that. Uh, so what now? You left the tortoise somewhere? I think I let something loose. Something they were carrying with them. What? Like heroin? No, oh, something worse. He imagined the shadow loping through the forest. Flying among the bodiless Leoc, feasting upon the grievers and the guilty, and the human guides who so delicately threaded the needle eye balance. A spirit monster out of its ecosystem, devouring all in its path, like a bulldozer on autopilot. I am so. Sorry. I never should have come to Bali. He felt Freddy's slow turn to look at him as an uncomfortable, unmistakable tension started to clog up the room. On television, 
the ghost swept aside her long black hair to reveal a gaping, pulsing wound. Rotten and squirming and infested and yet somehow very much alive. I was running as fast as I could, but I knew it was gaining on me. I swear it was trying to step in every puddle so I knew it was running faster. I turned my head where I could see it. Its arms were limp as they swung back and forth in front of its torso. Its disjointed jaw bounced up and down, making an uneasy chattering sound. And its plastic-like face was splattered in mud. How could I ever let this happen? It all started when my dad came home from work an hour late. Being the realist that I was, I figured he stopped for groceries or something. I guess I was half right when he came in carrying a box about a human child's size. You mind helping me with this, James? He asked. As I went to help him carry the box, I got a much closer look at it. It looked like an antique. The box was made of very smooth decorative wood and the edges of the opening were made of a reddish metal. After we placed the box on the coffee table in the living room, I asked Dad, what's in the box? It's a surprise for your birthday tomorrow, he replied. How much did this cost? That doesn't matter. You shouldn't worry about that. Expensive. Ever since my mom died, Dad would always buy me far too expensive presents, mostly on stuff I don't need. I would really want a new mattress for my room. Mine feels like a pile of rocks, and I find it really hard to sleep at night because of this. I was still thankful for whatever was in the box, of course, but I have to admit that the thing I was looking forward to most tomorrow was my friends coming over to hang out. That night when I was lying in bed trying to sleep, I heard a slight tapping coming from somewhere outside of my room. It stopped as quickly as it started, so I overlooked it. I continue lying in bed trying to sleep. I continue lying in bed trying to sleep. I continue lying in bed trying to sleep. Giving up, I turned on my phone to see that I had been trying to sleep for a little over an hour. In about 45 minutes, it would be my birthday. I began to hear the tapping again. It wasn't loud enough to wake anyone up, but it was certainly annoying. Unlike the first time I heard it, this time it didn't stop. A continuous tap that felt like it was digging into my brain. Eventually, enough was enough, and I crawled out of bed and left my bedroom. I followed the tapping around the house soon being led to the box sitting on the coffee table in the living room. I sat on the couch, and the tapping continued. Not being able to hold back, I began to open the box. I woke up from my dad nudging my head with his foot. I sat up and looked around to see that I had slept on the floor outside the living room. What are you doing down there? Dad asked. I don't know. I, I couldn't finish my sentence as I saw the box laying on the coffee table. That's when I remembered opening the box and seeing two deep reflective gray eyes on a beastly looking doll that slightly resembled a dog. What's in the box? That's why you were sleeping on the floor? Dad asked me. Go on and look inside. It's your birthday now. I stood up and slowly walked toward the box. I opened it to see not a dog, but a ventriloquist dummy. The only resemblance to the doll I had seen last night was the eyes. The dummy had pale skin, a big nose, and bright red hair made of the same material that the rest of the dummy's head was. The bottom jaw was oddly missing from the head, but I did find it under the dummy's body which was wearing an all-black suit. The bottom jaw had teeth carved into it, which I found weird since the top jaw didn't have any teeth, and the string that I would pull to open and close its mouth was the same string that holds the bottom jaw to the rest of the head. I slipped the string through a hole under the top jaw where I could grab it behind the back of its neck. I tied the string on the end so the bottom jaw doesn't fall off. The way the jaw hung there made it look much longer than it was. Do you like it? Dad asked. Of course, I replied. I saw it in a store window on my way home from work yesterday and thought of you and how you used to love ventriloquism, Dad said. I did always love ventriloquism. I had a ventriloquist act in my school talent show. 
While I was a talented ventriloquist, I wasn't a very good comedian. I didn't get any laughs. I would have been better off if the audience had booed me off stage. I put on a smile and sat the dummy on my lap. Through the dummy, I said, Hello, James, Dad. I'm Mr. Longjaw. You don't mind if I stay here a while, do you? Dad laughed as he said, You can stay as long as you like, Mr. Longjaw. The doorbell rang and I jumped up, setting Mr. Longjaw back in the box as I ran to the front door. When I answered it, hoping to see my friends, I was struck with disappointment as I saw my Uncle Zeke instead. I made sure that disappointment wasn't visible when he saw me, however. Hey there, birthday boy, Uncle Zeke said. How old are you today? I'm gonna need an answer. I really don't know. I'm 13, I said. What? You're not that old yet. Uncle Zeke had bright blonde hair and even brighter blue eyes. Being my mom's brother, he was the closest I've ever seen of her, genetically speaking. Uncle Zeke went over to the living room as the doorbell rang again. I opened the door to see my two closest friends, Rebecca and Tyler. Rebecca was a kind soul, but she was an absolute freak for the supernatural. Tyler, while also kind, freaked out with any mention of anything unnatural. Happy 13th, dude, Tyler said. That makes Rebecca younger than both of us. Rebecca punched Tyler in the arm. James is only a week older than me. I let Tyler and Rebecca in, and when we got to the living room, I saw Uncle Zeke holding Mr. Longjaw jokingly pulling up and down on the string chattering its teeth. Uncle Zeke noticed me and laid Mr. Longjaw on his lap before saying, Hey, James, would you like to introduce me to Mr. Longjohn? Longjaw, I corrected. Uncle Zeke picked up Longjaw and carried it over to me. As soon as I touched it, the bottom jaw fell off and bounced off the floor. Damn it! I picked up the bottom jaw and realized that the knot I had tied on the string was too thick for it to go through the hole. There was no possibility that it could have fallen off, and I needed to untie it to put it back on. When I got up, I made Mr. Longjaw say, Sorry, the sight of James made my jaw drop. Wow, oh, dude, you're really good at that, Tyler said. You should really look into being a professional ventriloquist, Rebecca said. How do you do that? Uncle Zeke asked. After a couple of hours goofing off with everyone, Dad left the room to answer his phone. When he came back, he said, James, that was the hospital calling. They need me in the ER today. I'm sorry, but I have to go. Keep Uncle Zeke out of the fridge. All right, Dad. See you tonight, I responded. The thing is, you might not. They need me to work late tonight. Okay, guess I'll see you tomorrow then. Happy birthday, buddy. After Dad left, we continued to goof off until it got late. After Rebecca and Tyler left, I put on a ventriloquist show for Uncle Zeke. You amaze me, James, he said. I don't know how you managed to throw your voice like that. I don't either, I said. It just kind of came naturally to me. Well, I better get going. I'll be sure to tell your dad you did a good job keeping me out of the fridge. I went to the bathroom as Uncle Zeke left. When I came back to the living room, Mr. Longjaw was gone. I figured that I had just misplaced it, so I just went to bed. I didn't stay in bed for long, though, as I heard a loud bang coming from the living room. When I went in there to check it out, I saw the box that Longjaw had come in on the opposite side of the room. This shocked me. There was no possible way for it to get there. I was too tired to worry, so I picked up the box and locked it in my closet. Once again, I wasn't quite able to sleep on my current mattress, and eventually I began to hear the tapping. I was expecting it to sound like it was coming from my closet, but I quickly realized that it sounded as though someone was knocking on the front door. I got out of bed and walked over to the front door. The knocking stopped as I got over there. I looked through the peephole. Nothing. I turned around to go back to bed when I heard the knocking again. I went to the kitchen and grabbed a knife for protection, but just the thought of ever needing to use it made me uneasy. Once again, the knocking stopped as I approached the door. I looked through the peephole and saw nothing again. I slowly opened the door to see no one around. I grabbed my house key from right inside the door before closing and locking the door as I went outside. I didn't want anyone getting in while I was looking around. I started looking around the house when I noticed something in the bushes. It looked like a hand. It was a hand. Mr. Longjaw's hand. 
Somehow, Longjaw got outside and was thrown in the bushes. I figured this was just a prank that Tyler, Jessica, or Uncle Zeke was playing on me, so I said, Ha ha, very funny, before grabbing Mr. Longjaw and unlocking the door. The door wouldn't open. The top lock was locked as well, but you can't lock the top lock from the outside. I gripped tighter on the knife as I unlocked the top lock and went inside. If this was a prank, it couldn't have been any of the earlier suspects because none of them had keys to the house. That's when I thought, Dad, he didn't need to go to work. It was all a part of his elaborate scheme, a prank beyond all pranks. So I yelled, Dad, this isn't funny anymore. Give it up. No response. I began to hear my phone ringing, so I put Longjaw down on the couch as I go to my room and check who it is. It's Dad. Of course it is. He hears me yelling and calls me to avoid suspicion. I answer saying, Dad, stop. This isn't funny. With which he responds, What are you talking about? Listen, we need to talk. My heart skipped a beat. He was talking pretty loudly into the phone, but I didn't hear his voice around the house. About what? I ask. Uncle Zeke, Dad replied. Did you see anyone around when he left? No, I went to the bathroom as he left. What happened? Someone was in the back seat of his car and stabbed him in the back of his neck, causing him to crash. He arrived here a few minutes ago. We don't know if he's going to make it. I dropped my knife before dropping to my knees. I looked around my room to see that my closet door was slightly open. I grabbed my knife again and stood up, walking toward the closet door. I opened my closet the rest of the way. Nothing was in there. That was the problem. I ran to the living room to see Mr. Longjaw sitting upright in its box with its bottom jaw laying on his lap. What are you? I asked. All realist thoughts fled from my head as Longjaw laid down on its back and the box closed around it. That's when I told myself, enough of this shit, as I walked over to the box, knife in hand, and opened it. The dog creature I had seen before jumped out at me, pushing me onto the couch. I tried grabbing it, but it wasn't showing any signs of stopping, so I sliced at it with my knife, causing it to let out a loud whimper and fall back onto the coffee table. That's when I looked into its reflective gray eyes. I woke up by my dad shaking me on the couch. James, James, are you okay? Dad screamed. What happened? I asked. That's what I should ask you, Dad replied. I came in here and you were passed out on the couch with cuts all over your face. Mr. Longjaw, the dummy. It's alive, I said. It did this to me. James, I'm going to need you to tell me the truth, Dad said. Why was I stupid enough to expect him to believe that? I had to tell him a lie instead. We went outside yesterday and I fell into some bushes. That's why my face is cut up and my mattress is uncomfortable, so I chose to sleep on the couch. Why didn't you tell me your mattress was uncomfortable? I would have gotten you a new one, Dad said. Here, I'll get you one tomorrow. Why not today? Because it's 11 o'clock at night today. You didn't think it was morning, did you? Well, you're going to have to spend one more night on that mattress. I need the couch so I can watch my shows. All right, I said as I stood up. That's when I remembered something. The knife that I was holding had disappeared. However, it wasn't long before I found it since the blade was sticking out of my bed right where I would be sleeping, like my mattress could get any less comfortable. That night I had a dream. You'd expect it to be a nightmare, but instead, I dreamt up a plan to get rid of Longjaw, pretty much chaining up the box while it was still inside and lighting the box on fire. The problem was, Dad wouldn't appreciate it if I lit my birthday present on fire, and it's not like I could tell him that I didn't like it so you'd take it back. I clearly enjoyed playing with it. That's not the problem, though. The problem is that Longjaw is threatening me, and I'm pretty sure it was the one who attacked Uncle Zeke, who I regrettably discovered had died from his injuries. That morning, I called Rebecca and Tyler and told them everything. Tyler responded, We have to kill that thing. Damn, this kind of thing isn't supposed to happen in real life. While Rebecca responded, Cool. It's about time I get to slay a demon. I told them to come over as I put Longjaw's bottom jaw back on. I then walked over to Dad's room to see if I could get him in the mix, but was instead met with a note that read, James, I'm out getting a new mattress for your room. Love, Dad. I guess Dad's never going to find out what happened today. 
When Rebecca and Tyler arrived, I picked up Longjaw and showed it to them. He looks like a dummy, Tyler said. And I'm not talking about the doll. Hang on, Tyler, Rebecca protested. Maybe it's just hiding its true self. Forget this, Tyler said. I should have realized that a living ventriloquist dummy was stupid. I'm going to the ice cream place down the street. If either of you wants to join me, you're welcome. Tyler leaves and Rebecca gives me a pitiful expression. Oh, go on. I know you like him, I said. Thank you, James, Rebecca said just before she left. Tyler was right. You are stupid, I said before throwing Longjaw across the room. I sat down on the couch and began to cry. I then turned my head to see Longjaw sitting up staring at me. That's when I thought of something. You're just a stupid piece of shit, I said. Longjaw then stood up. The only part of it still limp was its bottom jaw hanging by the string. I smiled as I opened the front door. You're just a shitty little bitch and you should piss off. I darted out the front door and passed Dad's car as it began to chase me. I stupidly ran into the woods. The puddles splashing behind me made me realize it was running faster than I could. I looked behind me to see that its arms were limp again, swinging back and forth and the mud from the puddles had splattered all over its face. I then took out my phone and video called Rebecca and Tyler. When they answered, I showed them Longjaw behind me. Shit, don't stop running, dude, Tyler yelled. I'm going to stop running. I yelled back. I put my phone in my pocket before stopping. I grabbed a stick that seemed pretty thick. As soon as Longjaw caught up with me, I swung the stick at it, breaking off the bottom jaw, causing Longjaw to stop running. Take this, Mr. Longjaw! I yelled as I swung the stick once more, knocking off its head into the mud. Longjaw's body falls limp as I pull out my phone to show my friends on the video call. You went for the head? That's so cool! Rebecca said, I then hung up the call and walked back home. When I got home, I saw that Dad's car was in the driveway. I went inside to look for him, and all I found was the same note on his door. Then I remembered. I saw Dad's car when I left. I opened the door slowly to see Dad's dead body hanging over the side of his bed. On his back was a note that read, Don't you recognize your Dad's handwriting? Then I heard a faint tapping sound coming from behind me. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights Thank you.